Hey everybody, welcome to the uh, first episode of what we are calling the Winemaker's Corner. And, uh, and I wanted to introduce myself, um, you know, in case you don't know who I am, if you've never met me before, I am one of the founding partners of California Fruit Wine. We're located in uh, the San Diego area in California. Um, three years ago, my brother and I started this business because uh, we saw something in fruit wine that really attracted us, and I'll get into that. Uh, probably in future episodes, but uh, that's who I am. Um, let me show you a second here what's going on with uh, our space. That's uh, it's half of it. <laughs> and then there's our tanks, and then we're getting some stainless steel stuff in in a little bit, but we're pretty excited about the way things are going. And uh, if you've been here, thanks for coming out and showing support. If you haven't, um, you'll see our website and you'll see when you can in the future. Uh, that having been said, the real reason why I personally wanted to start this blog is because the amount of uh, hesitance that I've seen among people in my age group uh, to even try and get into wine has been pr pretty high. It's, um, it's one of those things where since you've never actually maybe tasted a Cabernet grape, you don't know where to start or you, what a Chardonnay, there's just there's this huge uh, barrier to entry in order to even start getting into wine. And that's kind of one of the things that really attracted me to fruit wine. Um, in either case, I'm starting this right now so that perhaps I can give a little bit of confidence some of the things that I've learned over the years about wine so that when you do go wine tasting, um, whether it's locally here in San Diego or maybe Temecula, uh, you can kind of get in there with a little bit of knowledge. Um, so today, the, the lesson is going to be on wine tasting. Uh, that's kind of the first step that people really need to know uh, how to drink wine and you know why do people do certain things why um, why do they not do certain things I personally am of the persuasion because I'm not very snobby uh, pretty down-to-earth mellow laid-back type of guy that some of the things that are done are kind of overkill but some are extremely valuable so uh, I'm gonna try to bring value to your wine tasting experience uh, and just just hit on the things that are very important. Uh, that having been said, wine tasting for me always gets broken down into the basic four four things. Uh, the first is swirling the wine. Um, and, and if you're taking notes or if uh, you're trying to remember this, these are the four S's for wine tasting. I kind of came up with this. It's just an easy method of remembering the steps in, in which uh, if you go to a, a wine tasting room or if you go to a winery and they pour that glass of wine for you, uh, you know what to do when they give it to you. So, uh, first step is swirling the wine, as I stated. Now, this is, um, you know, some people just get it and they go right for it, but the reason this is done is because when oxygen comes into the wine, it ends up bringing out a lot of the characters that you wouldn't otherwise get. Uh, if you just drank the wine still and you went right like this, uh, you wouldn't get quite as much flavor, quite as much aromas. So, they do this because oxygen comes in and the surface area becomes greater and uh, you bring bring out what they call the bouquet of the wine which bring, brings us right into the second step of wine tasting which is uh, fruit flies yeah shoe fly um smelling smelling the wine so remember first s is swirl second s is smell and usually um you know just like with any smells what you're really trying to do is you're trying to draw on your past experiences of food or flowers or whatever it is so the important thing to keep in mind is whatever it smells like to you is what it smells like to you. If it smells like rotten cabbage, that's what it smells like to you, even if someone disagrees. So um, get your nose in there. I usually swirl a few times and then get in there. I'll do it a few more. It's almost like a, I do it with water now. It's kind of embarrassing because <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, for me, this is a, this is an apricot wine that we made, um, and. You know, obviously you get apricot, um, that's kind of, you know, just the uh, underlying, you know, smell there, but what you're also looking for is like notes of other things that you could probably pin. Um, they're much more subtle than the fruit itself. Um, sometimes you can get things like in this one, I almost get like this honey type of action to it. And then there's some floral aspects. This is, this is one of those wines that if you just let sit here, you can kind of smell it from back here because it's got a lot of uh, aromas. And uh, it's one of the important things, actually. That, you know, people have often wondered, why is a wine glass shaped like this where, you know, you get a mug of beer, it just goes straight up. 
Um, well, it, in the wine industry, they've they've discovered that because smelling is such an integral part of tasting the wine, it's the shape that captures the aroma and brings it in so that you can get it like that. If it was shaped outward, you wouldn't be capturing those aromas and it wouldn't be as uh, potent. So and now, now it's time for the fun part, <laughs> the uh, taste. Uh, and I, I have the S as sample, just to make it nice and easy. Uh, but you know, there's, there's once again, I've seen people here at the tasting room and in other, other wineries, where they go, okay, and they just down the whole thing. And that is definitely something you don't really want to do. It's kind of uh, counter, counter etiquette. It's just, you don't want to do that at all. So usually you take enough just to um, get your entire palate exposed to the wine. Uh, this is about a one ounce pour right here. Uh, maybe a little more. I don't know. We're kind of generous here, but um, basically the the nature of it is: look, you can't drink all this at once. You're going to do this with two or three tastes. Even though it's called a taste, it's really two or three. So, spin, smell, sample. <laughs> now, some of you are probably wondering what I was doing there. I didn't just just drink it actually swirled it around and things like that that's kind of you know you get you have to be brave in order to do that I understand that but it's something that really helps when you're looking to taste all the wine and get it all over your palate because you know your cheeks your tongue the sides of your tongue underneath your tongue these are all important tasting taste receptors that will help you analyze the wine determine what is it, what it is about the wine that you like or what what if it's tart if it's bitter whatever it is so in this case the apricot wine obviously um, you, not only do you get the apricot fruit, which is still lasting on my palate, you also get some tartness on the on the sides of your, my tongue. Um, so it's just it's just something that you have to process as you're tasting this wine. You have to think where is it um, being processed on my palate? What flavor does it remind me of? Um, and then you know, and then you're just really enjoying it. So once again, this is I got another two or three tastes still. Um, and you know, once again, you go to a winery, you taste five or six wines. You want that to last a while, so nurse it. You know, you don't <laughs> you don't just down it. And keep in mind, if you're tasting with other people, you know, try to keep pace with them. That's kind of wine etiquette, more or less. You know, if you go to a golf course, there's etiquette that goes into that. It's kind of the same for wine, and that's one thing I don't think is uh, is outdated or super traditional and, and whatnot. I think it, it has relevance when you do wine tasting. Um, and then, really, the last thing you could do. Now, this is this one is a little bit outdated, but it can be fun if uh, if you do it the right way. And that is, um, first of all, we got the swirl, the spin, we got the smell, the sample, and then when a lot of people do, and this is if you're kind of an, uh, an uppity, snobby wine drinker, you find this a lot in the Napa and Sonoma areas, it's actually spit the wine out. Um, a lot of these people, you know, they got Boku bucks to spend, the reason why they go to the wineries is because they have wine cellars at their house that are refrigerated, temperature controlled, they have hundreds and hundreds of bottles of wine and so they go to these wineries to actually taste the wine and buy cases at a time and put in their cellar. So it's one of those things where they're not going to get drunk so a spit is kind of an appropriate thing because they want to taste as many wines without being completely inebriated. <laughs> so, um, In this case I guess I will demonstrate there's really no pretty way to do it. Give me a second I'll be right back. And that doesn't really change the flavor, it just doesn't make you intoxicated. <laughs> so, um, if you noticed, I, I did do like a, a sucking in thing during the taste, and that's something I, I meant to mention. That's oxygen, once again, in the same way that spinning your glass brings in oxygen and brings out the flavor, when you do that in your own mouth and you do this like bubbling type of thing, it actually brings in oxygen and you get more flavor than if you just kept your mouth completely closed and, and not exposed to oxygen. So. Keep in mind, the whole purpose of this is to evaluate the wine, get some things out of it, get some fruit flavors out of it. There's a lot of vocabulary that goes into wine tasting, and um, a lot of it is things you may or may not have heard before. A good, a good example of that is bouquet, right? You got that smell, that bouquet. Um, there's a lot of other terms that I don't think are worth mentioning because for you, it's just describe it in your language. Uh, the I think that's where people lack confidence. Look, if you think this wine tastes like big league chew, 
<laughs> and say it tastes like gum, all right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, you don't have to say, hmm, I get cassis and black currant and all this other shenanigans. No, dude, just say what you process it as, and that's what makes wine meaningful to you. So uh, that's the end of the episode. Uh, wine tasting, we'll say wine tasting 101, intro to wine tasting, I don't know. Uh, I got several other topics I'm going to be um, going over over the next several video blogs. Uh, I hope that was a little bit of value to you. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be tweaking a few things. I'm, I'm contemplating getting some interaction from you guys, asking some questions, getting some feedback. Uh, if you got any opinions on the video, that would be great to send my way. But I do want to keep going with this because I do feel like people in my age group, which I know it's, it's not 17. I know a lot of people think I'm 17 years old. I get carded more here at the winery than I usually card people, but I'm 26 years old. So, uh, you know, in your 20s, when you start trying to get into wine, this is one of those things where people really uh, have that roadblock, and I want to remove that so that everybody can be as confident as I am about tasting wine. So, uh, next episode, I'm likely going to be the going telling you guys the difference between red wine and white wine, how it's made, and, and kind of the differences. Um, so, if you're interested in that, please stay tuned. Until then, uh, I'll catch you soon. Thanks for watching.